Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our meeting today, uh, which is a very important meeting. And we have changed our format a little bit because of this major issue. So it will be a kind of a consultation meeting. So title today is that Sri Lanka is now bankrupt. And what we're trying to see is how can we guide our motherland to turn around? So this is what we are going to talk very widely. It's a very wide topic, but let's see how far we can get today. So before we um, proceed, I'd like to share a very small clip of a video and uh, just give me a second to get this online. <laughs> Mamana <laughs> Daru Kanda Makmin, Egola, me, Ilani, Egolanta de Valimi, Egolo, Avila, me, Gagahani, Avin Pida Vidala, Vasim Pida Vidala, Kanda Natu, me, Javi, Champan, Darupidis, me, Ilani, Anaga, the Parampara, the Ratak, the Ekali Apicua, Jadamin, Bende Vilangula, Maki Puta, Reginayan, Indica to an Angilitala, the Tisan Vade Pamunuan. Alut lova kungena sitim, dandu am din varadanam, kumante irata atikarene, mitia saha vinisuran. Aya pikua Aurudu did the has pansi yakunden, vaya sai mate magi du putu me. Le kiri dun un le turabi kiri kandura kunet magi titani daru tun vedua daru tun hedua un vedi hari aku sora de tu daru an un u tarayan merayan. Magidi ka mata vina kitu. Kumu kiwa api? Then ada damai magitan me taruan te. Iba wa bunta te lati irati. Insa me taruna jave te. Taruna shakti te. Ego le te hita gandai. Api me tanta ave. Okay, today's agenda uh, is I will try to do an outline for about 20 minutes. And there shall be uh, volunteer presentations for five to 10 minutes each, followed by a discussion about each presentation. And also any other volunteers who want to present as well, they can do, they can talk. And then we'll talk about the next steps. I mean, it looks like we may need another session to continue on the same topic, we'll see. So here we are, take an example. We are like a sinking ship. Sri Lanka is now started to sink and we're bankrupt because the, our debt is now US dollars 51 billion. Now, when we have a situation like this, we need to think very carefully. Now, trying to change the captain alone in the middle of nowhere 
imagine this shape, is unlikely to resolve the crisis. Changing the leadership can be done after initial stabilization, but still may not bring the expected outcome. We all need to participate in broader action beyond our usual job descriptions and competencies. Being united is the key to success. We've already done this with the COVID and particularly healthcare workers. We know that we had dental nurses doing medical jobs. We had medical students doing medical jobs. So we all work together, not within our job descriptions, but in other things as well. So doctors who never did intensive care came to do the intensive care. So, so that's the way we worked when there was a real disaster. So we need collective action. That's what we lead trying to do. So we've been discussing various topics for the last say three or four months. And then we have identified certain areas to take forward. So we had two ideas, rescue and recovery. And rescue was mainly focused on how to reduce wastage. And that's corruption. We've talked about corruption quite a lot and how we should we have, we still got more to talk about that. And then to increasing productivity and we've identified two items at least about energy production in Sri Lanka and, and education. And research, we haven't even touched about Sri Lankan problems and how to do obstacle-free research. Now, recovery is a long process and we have not discussed this at all. It needs a lot of debate and then consensus and finally a constitutional change. So that's a long process. But at the same time, we discuss and denounce certain things. Now, um, violence it has never brought anything for us. So we denounce violence totally. There are no winners. We all will be the losers if we resort to violence. Number two, we talked about um, uh, energy requirements and how to reduce the import of fossil fuel and good ideas came through. At least individually or small groups can do these things, producing solar energy and biogas. And Professor Dharmdas came forward and in fact asked me to publicize this email so that people can communicate directly and get involved to do something that will be beneficial to them. So that's the energy, energy in a realistic way to go forward. Now we have this issue. How can we guide our motherland turnaround? So this is kind of an emergency situation. Say I'm a medical healthcare worker. So when you have a disaster of this nature, say if there's an issue with a patient who had a, who had a real damage or something like that, we tend to go really core root cause analysis. And by whom? It's normally conducted by the governance. So if it's a country, it should be the parliament who will do a root cause analysis. Why do we do a root cause analysis? Because we don't know whether it's an accident. We don't know whether it's because of ignorance. We don't know whether it's negligence, or we also don't know whether it's purposeful. So this is why we need to have open mind. Now here is an advert which came up for an event that was held yesterday, talking that Sri Lanka is a failed state and demanding a separate Tamil nation. So I don't want to say where it originated from, but these are the things that's happening. Now go back to the root cause analysis that we were talking about. So when you really look at this, then you begin to wonder, was the bankruptcy masterminded by our own? So keep that in your mind as well. We don't know, but better to have all the options until we have answers at some point. But most important thing is be aware, do not get distracted with this kind of thing, maintain our mission and follow the principles. Means we learn from each other, we educate each other, we assess with facts and evidence and then decide. So hopefully that will help Sri Lanka go forward. So in addition to the things that we discussed, now the resuscitation in a disaster gets important. And that's what we are going to talk about and try to focus today. Now, as soon as the bankruptcy was declared, the following day, a letter from the new governor came across of the central bank. And in fact, I circulated this letter as well because somebody forwarded it for me to forward it. But look at the real stats. Real stats, we have about 3 million expats. Out of that 50% are housemates or doing similar jobs and average affordability for them 
It's only hundred dollars a month for the family who can send back. Then of all these expect that 25,000 students go abroad annually and the parents in Sri Lanka has to fund them. And then expect families have dependent husbands, wife, children, elderly parents. So not much left for them to send back. So can they fund USD 900 million debt payment we need now? Probably not. But here's some other information for your thinking. Now there's a SLPP ex-minister, a cryptocurrency account has 1 million Bitcoins. Now I cannot verify this directly. Obviously you can't verify it, but I know the name of the person who's distributed or, or declared this information. So, and then the rate today for one Bitcoin is rupees 40,000. And if you look today at that, you'll get USD 42 billion. And that's four fifths of our debt as a country. And here is another one. The Katnaga Highway uh, corruption, we talked about that, identified as 822 million US dollars. And that's been disclosed by a letter that's uh, in public domain that was sent by Chinese embassy to the uh, president. So see where we are. Now today, this is the uh, Sri Lankan delegation has left to USA for IMF discussion. This is today's news. So what is going to come? We are going to get austerity. That means no pleasures, but at least it will make sure that the government is accountable for every dollar they get from IMF. That's, that seems something. Now let's listen to another um, uh, um, video clip, which will give you some more information. This comes from Victor Ivan, uh, editor who's been there for a uh, paper editor who's been there for 25 years. Akshola Kerala Katita Salakan Behe, Rudda Pakshi Kerala Katita Salakan Behe, Mahajana Negitima, Luku Mahajana Negitima. Prajatan Travadi, Desupal, Kramia Tula, Mahajania to me Balitino. Prachanda Novena Takal, Tamange, Viro de Palagiri, Mata Mavi theatre, Satiganang Harivadi Villa, Viro de Palakaran, Kissima Prasna to IT. Ekian is Silu Dena, what to you to Ekianika, Dinagani, Marisanki in the Kriya. Etakota, a Sanki in the Kriya will lea, Jayagani, Matavashe, Prakna, me Taruna Parapurta, Tian on the Kianika Prasta. I'll do a theorem that you to. Prate Paramadi Patti Bale Tierni Mahajanea, E Mahajanea may par in Apita Abunana Mokakari Balea, Eka then soon Yavelati. There were a bit of Pulong, you and Nikawake, can you could exact that in the Tianapulong in? I will like any make a cotascari queen. A pay look, I can eat which the parliament to Isra, Ekani Munoal Bandagan, Ekani Etantenoa, Ayuda Taragana, number plates, Nati, Ekani. Motorbikes, Muna Vilu at the Eva Karana Pah, Yudahamuda, the police here, the Niti Ram of Tula Vatical Yutu. Niti Kyogiing, Niti Putting Hana, Kuhumdeva make a make a Askaragati, Boma Hoda the Akat. An e talent ain't no Niti Putti, whatever they got put Salakan no Mahajania, Mahajania Gaiti was. Hitapu Janadi Putti, Pavichikar, Pukarek, Laksha Panda Hakatawada. It must say Amati would recut a hammer, Amati would recut a one, the high to what a pouch. Tama take any apidan in a la Santa Wake and a very cow the kill. It was a pretty posaganagi cow the kill apidan, Nabi Kissima, Nikangara, the Hajara, Rataka, Tapita Pupakalati, Kuavakasha, Lanka, Alutra, Taka, or Patkara. So this is actually an opportunity. So we've had similar opportunities in the past. Unfortunately, we lost them. Post-tsunami was a perfect opportunity in 2004. I remember my own nurses going to help in the volunteer buses the day following tsunami to North, and they went to certain areas that they didn't even know that they've been helping some LTT people during that time. So all the barriers just broke down after tsunami at that time. Then uh, post end of war, uh, in our war, in 2009 was another opportunity. We lost that. But be united, look back and rethink, get involved, designation, color, gender, race, qualifications, completely irrelevant. All ideas are valuable, needs evaluation, realistic application. That's what we need. Do what we can do individually, do what we can do collectively, 
maintained continuous progress because Sri Lanka has these waves, it comes up and then it disappears. So, but I think if we can maintain progress, we can recover. That will lead us to permanent resolutions in the long term. So let's see four countries that went bankrupt, but live to tell the tale. Now in the boxes, you will say, see the population they had. So Mexico went into bankruptcy with 80 million US dollars in 1982, and they have 128 million. 1998, Russia went bankrupt. And then for $17 billion, they have 144 million population. Argentina went bankrupt in 2001, 145 billion uh, debt. And Iceland <laughs> went bankrupt in 2008 with 85 billion, but they had only a population of 0.4 million. And now Sri Lanka, we have 22 million population, but we have a debt of $51 billion. So imagine the proportionately how much we have. Lots of ideas come through what to do. The end result is what you're talking here. Get the president to resign. Get clean, intelligent people to parliament. Return the stolen money. Have a new governance with intelligent, competent people. All very good ideas. So the protests are going peaceful. And when the protests can get hijacked, this is the history. We know that the protests get hijacked eventually. And then it becomes violent, and that will be the end of the story. Then there'll be election under the same rules, and the outcome is going to be no better. This is why we need to be quite careful. So how to get there is what we need to focus. That's what we are trying to do through leads. How to get there? We know what to do. That, of course, there are lots of people who have good ideas. So I'll share another uh, video uh, for you to listen to. ले <laughs> so today we have uh, some presentations from Professor Dharma Dasa and then Kirti Devendra. I've also received some communications from several people. Uh, so I'm going to share some of this very, very quickly, and then we'll go into the presentations. So this is from uh, CS Vira Ratna, uh, published about Sri Lankan currency plunge into worse, worse performing in economic meltdown. So they summarize and it sent, uh, she sent me the document. And so foreign exchange crisis resolution, then there was suggestion that increase export earnings, reduce expenditure on imports. I'm putting this up because it was factual. So tea, rubber and coconut uh, contributes to about 20% of our earnings, but this has been static for the last five years and there's been no management thing to increase production. So there is a need to promote that. And then there was a huge demand in say, promote, 
for high potential crops. We have not done that. Say spices, then uh, medicinal herbs, etc. And in particular, cinnamon has now got ESP plus, uh, uh, so that European market will soar for cinnamon this year. So, so there, there are opportunities that you can do. And then there was suggestion to develop agro industries like cassava, castor, aerobic herbicide, and export dehydrated food. Reducing expenditure, there was suggestion that we also heard that there's a lot of import of foods that we can actually produce in Sri Lanka, but we are not really promoting that. And then reduce import of fuel. Now, we, fuel we've discussed a lot, but here there's a promotion for ethanol as an alternative for petrol. Ethanol is used as a biofuel in many countries, Brazil, Australia, France, India, Sweden, USA, South Africa. So it's been used and there are ways of promoting it. That's what's in. Dendro power, we've already discussed some uh, weeks ago. So, but look at us, we are a very small country. We got 22 million people and look at our political weight. We have elected politicians in the parliament, provincial council and local election together, 9,099 in total. That means we have a politician for every 2,400 people. And these 2,400 people have to support politician salaries, the perks, the security, official residences, official vehicles, duty-free vehicle permits, salaries, and for service staff. So what do they have brought us in return to the public? Bankruptcy. We heard already our debt is one person more than 1 million rupees. Imagine. Look at the legislation. We don't even know these, but this has obviously come through the parliament. Look at the presidential secretaries and prime minister's office. They are allowed to do secret transactions, not cited, only need P prime minister or president's approval. Both offices are not subject to audit by law. So nobody can challenge what's happening there. Look at the number of diplomatic missions that we have. Here is a list of these. These are all diplomatic missions that we support all around the world. And it's more than 70 I counted and they all cost dollars. That means it has to be paid by us, the taxpayer from Sri Lanka. So I've also received now communications to share from uh, Jampathy, Molligode, Manilka, Fernando, and Mervin Silva. I just briefly mentioned those, but they can, if they're in the audience, they can discuss more. Now, this is together. I put uh, these communications there together because they're similar and together. So, uh, Diampathy and Malika proposes that reduction of public sector expenditure, serious <laughs> restructuring of state owned enterprises. So close duplicate institutions. Vehicle usage must be curtailed. Ministries pruned through voluntary retirement schemes. Investment for solar, wind, power, electricity. Invite foreign investment under uh, private uh, public partnership. So by identify idle assets, Without going by old slogans such as selling national assets, which is an important area we need to focus. Follow UN sustainable development goals, as well as increase investment in education. So major constitutional changes are required. This is what most people are telling. Then they're asking, what's the immediate crisis governance model? Now, this is something that people are talking a lot about. And where have all the intellectuals gone? This is another thing that you're talking about. That shows our political apathy, but this is now improving and people are contributing. Mervyn Silla has more things and uh, profession, uh, proposals. He says protests should continue until the president and government resign. A council, a non-executive kind of directors to come into temporary governance and then go to IMF, et cetera a cabinet of handpicked professionals, a constitution amended getting rid of the executive presidency. Uh, to become an MP, one needs at least a degree, no criminal record, declare their assets. We need to get rid of party system that has divided the country. MP should be performance reviewed and paid the decent salary. There should be zero tolerance for corruption. So these are good suggestions, but 
needs wider discussion, particularly to see how are we going to achieve this. I don't know whether we can, we can probably discuss that at a later on. So I'm now inviting uh, the two people who told me that they are going to do some slide presentations. Uh, Professor Sosa and also Kiel C. Devin. Right? Try to get the point as well. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, what I want to uh, present within these few slides, future energy sources to power Sri Lanka and how to recover from the current crisis within this subject area. I don't want to go beyond my knowledge and experience. I will stick to energy sector. I must tell you that uh, I have been promoting renewables over the last 32 years, globally and especially in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm tired of talking. From now onwards, my talks are going to be hard talks, Chula. Yeah, very uh, good. <laughs> I, I got some figures here uh, just for discussion uh, from the internet. Total energy production capacity in Sri Lanka is about four gigawatt, gigawatts. If you divide that energy, 66% comes from fossil, imported fossil fuels. 34 comes from renewables. Out of 34, 31 comes from hydro. And non-hydro, wind, solar, biomass, these are indigenous energy sources, very low. We have been promoting this for, for 31 years. Unfortunately, the Ceylon Electricity Board and the government had a deaf ears, and that is why the country is at the rock bottom today. That is why we have power cuts. What I want to do is, just to go through this renewable energy list, what are the renewable energy we can use in the country and then reduce this fossil fuel dependence. So this is the list. People always give this list. I'm going to take one by one and then uh, select the right ones for Sri Lanka. Before I go to that, uh, can I discuss can Sri Lanka develop with its own fossil fuel reserves? That is one thing I want to discuss. Mana Basin gas oil exploration goes back to the early 1970s. I was in the university and we were uh, hearing about it for the first time. We heard the same story again and again for 50 years, but exploration is not yet completed. 50 years talking, just talking, not doing anything. Even if an oil company agrees to work on this reserve, delivery time could be one or two decades. It is not easy. It, can it is not a, a solution for us. Globally, countries are now working to move away from the carbon economy, that is from fossil fuels, due to their polluting effects. Oil companies are now moving to renewable energy sources. So they are not, uh, in, so the world is going in the other way and we cannot expect uh, this happen. Uh, somebody will come and do it for us. The trend is to move towards carbon neutral economy and then to hydrogen economy. Therefore the use of mana based oil reserves for the development of Sri Lanka is highly unlikely. It is just a dream. Our people just talked for 50 years, did nothing. Number two, we'll take the first one. Nuclear energy is not an option for Sri Lanka at all. I will, I will uh, leave this. I purposely left these uh, details. I will take one by one. Nuclear technologies categorize the nuclear energy as a low carbon clean energy. That is why the nuclear energy comes to the renewable energy list. This is true only during the lifetime of the power generation. There is no carbon dioxide emission. But what about the carbon dioxide emission takes place during uranium mining and purification? 
during at least a decade of building and commissioning the power plant, as well as decommissioning of the plant at the end of the working lifetime. Since the surrounding materials are all radioactive during decommissioning, it can be many times longer and many times expensive than commissioning of a nuclear plant. So these are all there. Nuclear technologies hide all these things from the general public. There are many unresolved safety issues with this technology. Handling of radioactive waste is not satisfactory. And also the conventional fission power plants could create huge disasters to the society due to terrorist attacks or damages due to earthquakes or tsunamis. These are beyond human control. Now fusion reactors are in research. They are still in experimental level. So tsunami damage in well-developed and well-disciplined Japan is a good example. They couldn't control it. This technology may help in fully developed countries, but is certainly not an option for Sri Lanka. These are the uh, pictures of nuclear plants. This is one, this is another one. This lady is one of my heroes. Why I say that, uh, she's Angela Merkel, a uh, German chancellor for 16 years, recently uh, gracefully retired in Germany. And she is a physics graduate. And also, she has a PhD in physics. The physics people know they learn about nuclear energy, they teach about nuclear energy, and she knew the subject. So she decided to close down all 17 nuclear plants in Germany. And today, out of 17, there are only three remains. That is the subject knowledge. And also one other thing I want to tell you, why she is my hero. She lives in a normal house in Germany with her husband. As the chancellor, she doesn't have a special house. And also every Saturday, she walks with her husband to the local market, buy vegetables and fruits. In carrier bags, she walks back to her home. Can you compare with our leaders? German chancellor is equivalent to our president of the country. This is the difference. That is why the Germany is uh, doing extremely well today. Renewable energy is more than 50%. And can you see the power here, power of knowledge, and also the corrupt nature of our leaders in the country. Number three, geothermal energy is also not an option for Sri Lanka. There are good people have done research and improved the knowledge. L let us look at this. Geothermal energy appears in the renewable energy list, but there are only 22 power plants around the globe. They produce only 15 gigawatt of power, very small. Why don't they expand? The large capital cost is one thing, loan time to build is another, and there are other dangers. Now, if you look at this, this is the sketch of a, a geothermal power plant. You need to pump pressurized water into the deep into the crust to get the heat from the inside and get the steam out and with the steam produce electricity. That is the technology. This is the real system. This is how it looks like in a real system. So if you look at, if you look at when you, when you uh, pump pressurized water into the crust, it is a good cause for generating unwanted earthquakes. I will give you one example. I live in the North of England in Lancashire, they used uh, the method called fracking to get shale gas. This is the gas trapped in the earth crust. What they did was they put uh, pressurized 
water into the crust and release the gas. And this is one such system in Lancashire. So that is the system to send pressurized water. When that happened, when they started this one, they had three tremors within one week. So they had to hold its operation after three small earth tremors were recorded in less than a week. Can you see the dangers? We don't need to disturb the mother nature. We don't want to disturb the environment. Then we will see the effects. Because of these harmful uncertainties, large capital cost and time it takes to build a geothermal power plant, Sri Lanka cannot afford this type of technologies. So this is why we say, I think we all academics, we need to do research, we need to be knowledgeable, but at the same time, we need to say there are dangers and we need to say to the politicians, uh, this technology is not suitable for Sri Lanka. Let me tell you something. If somebody goes, a professor or somebody goes to a, a political leader and say, we'll go for this, and the people will ask, what is the cost of this? 20 billion. They will love it because the commission from 20 billion is very handsome. They don't know the problems. I think it is the responsibility of academics and researchers to tell the truth. Don't take the wrong message to political leaders. Let me tell you one thing here. Uh, I'm going back to this one. Uh, about 12 years ago, you know that uh, China, South Korea, and Russia, they are all going to sell a nuclear plant to Sri Lanka. About 12 years ago, South Korean people came and met the president. And president agreed. Why? To build one of these, it cost 50 billion. Can you see the... Uh, mentality of the leader. The commission is very handsome, but he doesn't have a clue about what this lady knew. She's a physicist. She had a PhD in physics and she closed everything, but our leader decided to bring one in 2025. And they started to do feasibility studies they sign a contract in Geneva and APSL somehow knew it. And we are the people who opposed it by writing to the uh, high authorities in Sri Lanka and to the Atomic Energy Authority in uh, Geneva. These are the things happening. That is why our country is at the rock bottom today. People are not doing the right decision for the country. What about the tidal and wave energy? These technologies are not yet ready to use in Sri Lanka. The potential to use these two technologies in Sri Lanka is there since it is an island surrounded by the ocean. However, tidal power stations need a huge capital and suitable sites. This is one site. If you don't have a site like this, you can't build one. It is simply getting the water there and releasing. It is hydropower, it is a brilliant system. You need a good place, good site, and then we need to build these dams and it hasn't happened. And wave energy. I know in Peradenia and in other universities, the research has happened. The waves going up and down, research has happened, but research is not enough. We have to go through scaling up and commercialization and build something like this to, to get the energy out of the system. Therefore, for the economic development of the country soon, very soon, these technologies may not contribute. They may come in the future, but not in the near future. This is a very busy uh, <clears throat> slide. I don't normally use a lot of uh, text in my slides, but I purposely did this for our people to read. This is our solution. 
the most suitable energy technology mix to power Sri Lanka, uh, fossil fuel and hydropower, solar, wind and biomass and biogas. You will see why I have put fossil fuel in amber and these are in green. We should go for these. Later, we should uh, face this out. So I will just point out only a few things. What we need to do is while using existing fossil fuel power plants, we already have them. We have to use them carefully, manage them, maintain them, and accelerate the introduction of renewables. This is what we have been telling last 32 years, but the CEB resisted to introduce renewables. And when we asked them to come and give a presentation in 1992 in our conference in Colombo, what they said was future of Sri Lanka is coal, coal, coal. That is why we are in this trouble. So what we need to do is hydropower is saturating, but still there may be some areas to increase the capacity. So we have to do the water management to keep at, at least at that level. It is essential to have trees around, bromo trees, uh, preserve uh, forests, uh, repair natural lakes so that we can have the water, uh, that water management is very important in the country so that we can maintain the hydropower capacity at least today's level. Solar and wind are the best well-established two technologies to date. In fact, solar is, very important because it is panels. It is not huge. It is modular system. You can, you can uh, uh, install one and later you can expand, expand more. So uh, if you take a wind, uh, one wind uh, turbine is a huge system, but these two are well developed. And if you look at the solar, Around the globe, solar power is reaching now terawatt scale. At the moment, it is 900 gigawatt at present. The current global PV solar installation rate is over 140 gigawatt per annum. Can you see? That is the rate. As a country closer to the equator, we know that some years ago, Surya Bala Sangrame came, but there were a lot of breaks on it. If we have five kilo, if we have one million five kilowatt solar roofs in the country, that means we have five gigawatts. That is more than the power we need for Sri Lanka during the daytime. So we can save the water in the reservoirs during the night so that we can use during the night time. So this is what we need to do. We need to manage it. As an agricultural country, biomass potential is extremely high. As Chula mentioned before, biogas is very important. Um, I know that biogas research has been done in, uni in universities. In many villages, people are using it. This is the ideal opportunity for entrepreneurs to come up and scale this up make systems and sell one system to each home and ask those, say bye-bye to those uh, rata gas. We don't need to depend on those imported gas. Allow them to close those two uh, gas companies. Gas queues will disappear. This is the opportunity. I am asking every Sri Lankan to start a, a biogas system in the country. Please remember, uh, we may not power 100% of the houses because uh, the houses on uh, uh, high stories, I don't know how it can be used, but even then people will have a very nice system if entrepreneurs can come and that will be uh, great for the country. And when the renewables produce adequate energy for the country, it will be a good time to gradually phase out fossil fuel power generation. It may take, these things will produce enough energy. Perhaps it will take another 
10 years, perhaps 15 years. At that time, we can gradually phase this out. That is why it is in number. I'm coming to my last uh, slide. Uh, replicate solar villages to develop every corner of the country, reducing poverty. Solar villages have been designed, piloted, and now replicated in Sri Lanka. Five solar villages have been established, and four more villages are currently being developed. Now, this project is to empower needy communities and accelerate their sustainable development, enabling them to escape from poverty traps. Please remember, solar village is a nice name we use, but we can use this in urban areas. 80% of our people live in villages. So this kind of projects can do wonders. If you, if you take all the activities taking place in solar villages, it is to mitigate damaging effects of climate change. And these communities, about 1,000 people in each village, are guided to work together without corruption. That is our first thing. Because this is the solar roof. It brings income to the village. And we are asking them to manage it without corruption. I will tell you one example. The second village is my favorite one. These are two pictures from the second solar village, not here. You can read the, uh, the details from these two. And in fact, two years ago, before the COVID, when I talked to them, they said they have uh, accumulated uh, 45 lakhs in their bank account. 45 lakhs. In fact, uh, what they do is they use those funds to, to uh, give microcredits with some interest. So people develop and pay back. And also they have a water purification system. They pump water, purify water, and sell water uh, for a nominal fee to avoid kidney diseases for about eight villages. That is the main income. And on the New Year Day, two days ago, I telephoned them and I was so delighted to hear that they have over 60 lakhs accumulated in the count. Can you see how, uh, how good they are doing? And also they said next to this uh, building, they are building a new VDC office building, uh, two stories. They have done the first level. I suggested to have a, a solar roof on the top because they have 60 lakhs. They need only eight lakhs these days to have another solar roof. Can you see how they are uh, progressing? This is a good example, role model for Sri Lankan universities. So there are three things. Don't be in the dark, use some solar home systems and have some light. And don't be in the uh, gas queues, uh, use some biogas system in the home and say bye to biogas pollings. Number three, if you want to develop the whole country, use a solar villages to develop every corner of the country. I am stopping there, and I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ramdas, for that. I was a bit worried that you said you're going to stop education because you're fed up. But your class has changed because now you got not just university students, but kindergarten students, advanced level students, university students, everybody in one class. So imagine the difficulty that you have to teach. So please continue. This, this presentation is now open for discussion if, you, if anyone has got any suggestions. I mean, I was talking to all these people in the past three decades. Uh, what I said was, I, I'm tired of talking now. And now Sri Lanka is at the rock bottom. Now, from now onwards, uh, my talks are hard talks. That is what I said. I will be talking to everyone. Great, thank you. But imagine it's going to be everybody in one class, kindergarten to up to university students in one class. It's, That's the situation. <laughs> okay, any, any comments? We can move to the next presenter if, that's, if any comments are there. Anybody raising hands? I haven't seen anybody raise hands. 
Kirti. Ah, Kirti is raised hand. hand. Yeah, Kirti and Deepal, they have raised hands. Yeah. I don't know who came first. I think Kirti. Yeah, I think you had the, yeah. Kirti, you want to talk? Just to make a couple of observations. <clears throat> Obviously, um, Professor Dharmadasa covered a lot of subjects. He started with the um, <laughs> mana base in gas and oil explorations. The first comment I want to make is that I joined the Petroleum Corporation in Sri Lanka in 1972 for that project. So I worked for that project in 1972, 50, 50 years ago. Then I left that, I went back to the university. Then I was to do, I was asked to do nuclear physics to, with, the, with, the, with the intention of doing research in nuclear physics in Sri Lanka. So in fact, I did an MSc in nuclear physics. Having done that, I having done it very well, the Edinburgh University gave me a scholarship to do a PhD in nuclear physics, but I decided no, because I decided at the time, nuclear physics was, nuclear energy was not the right thing for Sri Lanka. So I decided to do something very different. So when people are suggesting we need either oil exploration or nuclear physics or nuclear energy in Sri Lanka. It is clearly not based on logic. It's not clearly based on you know, economics. It's not based on uh, real project planning or project management. It's based on commission. So we need to be very conscious of that fact. So um, I, I agree with most of the comments made by Professor Dharmadasa. We need to be focusing on solar power and hydroelectricity mostly, and perhaps a combination of other things. The other thing is, I like to mention is that the tidal power was something investigated and a lot of work was done by the company I worked for. I personally wasn't involved, but the company I worked for spent a lot of money, millions of pounds on that project. So again, I can talk about it, but I don't know to. So, I think Sri Lanka should be thinking about solar power and wind power and hydroelectricity for the foreseeable future. That's that's my comment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kirti. I think Deepal, are you still wanting to ask a question? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I actually missed the first half, uh, first half an hour, but uh, I joined the at the beginning of Professor Dharmadasa's talk. Uh, yeah, uh, as a person who is working on geothermal, I think uh, I learned a lot about uh, the geology, which I haven't learned during the last 40 years. Uh, the thing, uh, it's, it's quite a surprising. I, it's a new thing that uh, the geothermal drilling or uh, pumping water is causing uh, earthquakes. Actually, I like to know how it can cause earthquake because I, uh, during la my last 40 years, I haven't learned such a subject, such, a, such knowledge. Uh, Professor Subhachanga, uh, this has happened because uh, in UK, they were trying to get shale gas. They were, they were uh, pumping pressurized water into the uh, earth crust. And this is the third picture is one system in Lancashire. It is in the uh, Lake District, about 40 miles away from where I live. And this system started to pump. And then within uh, three weeks, there were three earth tremors. It is not only this one, S suddenly, and they stopped the operation of this. And it is not only here. It is in several places in UK, they experience the same thing. And then what we are doing is we are simply disturbing the mother nature. And that is what, and if that is the case, we shouldn't go into that. In, in uh, geothermal, of course, you may have to even go deeper to, to get, because the shale gas is on the top. It is just to get the, the gas trapped in the uh, top uh, layers. But uh, for geothermal, you need to go even deeper to get the heat energy. So obviously, 
we have to learn from these. I mean, I learn a lot uh, by listening to you, your research, and that is what we should do. We should learn from each other's research, and then we should look at what is happening around the globe and what are the advantages and disadvantages. Because if we go and suggest this to a, 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 a political leader in Sri Lanka and say, this will cost 20 billion, he will say yes, because he's only looking at the commission he gets. That is why, so it is our responsibility, Professor Subhasingha, uh, learn about it and uh, discuss the disadvantages and advantages if it is not advantageous to the country and say no to that, don't suggest it. Even if they come up with it, like we did uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, oppose it. When the government authorities decided to bring a nuclear plant to Sri Lanka, uh, APSL wrote a letter, very strong letter to the government authorities and also to the academic uh, uh, atomic energy authorities in, uh, in Europe. So that way we opposed it, giving real reasons, not just uh, to oppose it, giving the real reasons why nuclear is not suitable for Sri Lanka. So they accepted it. So I think it is our duty, the educated community to uh, tell the truth and uh, guide the country. Otherwise, this is what happens. We haven't guided because most of the educated people were silent in the country. And that is why today we are at the rock bottom. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Pradhan Sir. Um, I think Kirtis raised the hand again, but he has also got a presentation and the time is quite crucial because some people <laughs> yes. had to leave as well. So, um, Kirti, can, I, can I make a, just a quick comment about um, uh, that geothermal energy? In yeah, Switzerland, okay. now Professor Danvas was talking about what happened in, in the UK. In Switzerland, so a few years ago, they did the project. They invested a lot of money for geothermal energy. Now I can check the information. Within a week, they observed 13,000 tremors. That's because when you inject water into that uh, area in the earth crust, all kinds of things happened. So as a result, Switzerland gave up that project. Now, in Switzerland, normally they don't have any earthquakes. That was a completely new experience for them. Thank you, Katie. So, Thank you, Katie. It, it proves it. There are so many examples around the globe. I think we need to learn together from this. Yeah, actually, sorry, but uh, I have to say that the geology plays a major crucial role. Is when, when you consider the geology of Sri Lanka, it is they are totally crystalline rocks with totally metamorphic and crystalline rocks, where I think UK, I lived there and I know it is it's very weak uh, sedimentary rocks, all mo mostly limestone and sandstone. So that may have a major role in that. So, I'm, but I'm anyway. sorry, Professor Zubasinga, I fully disagree with that. Geology is different. These things practically, when you do it, you can see it in UK, you can see it in Switzerland. Now, if you find out more, I think I hear that even in United States, uh, shale gas is there. They uh, recorded something. So uh, don't just depend on geology theoretical uh, uh, knowledge. And if it is harmful, don't touch it. Yeah, sorry, but I haven't learned anything, but that, that is something I had to learn. Maybe I haven't learned that during my last 40 years, but I have to, I'm ready to learn I that think, part of geology. I if think, you have I any think, links, I can uh, do that, yes. Thank you, Deepal. I think we have to move on. And it's a, it's a very subject area that needs a professional input. So I can I move on to the next speaker, Kirthi? And also then there are other people waiting to talk as well. So if you can please um, uh, do it in the shortest possible time, that would be good, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yeah, we can do, yeah. thank you. Right, okay. The current crisis, some opportunities and potential solutions. Now, of course, 
um, there are many, many different issues contributing to the current situation. Not one, not two, many, many. So um, I'm only going to cover only a selected few issues. So, um, but before I go into those issues, let me cover a bit of background. The constitution, the, the constitution we inherited at independence was changed in 1970 and again in 1978. It now appears that some of these changes were not properly thought out. Uh, so, uh, so this is still a background. In a democracy, there are three branches of governance, legislature, executive, and judiciary, three pillars. All these three pillars should remain independent of one another to maintain good governance. So the other thing is, all, three, 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 all these three pillars get the authority from the transfer of sovereign authority held by the people, people of the country. They transfer that power by vote. In addition to the three main pillars to maintain good governance, a country needs several other independent institutions, such as Central Bank, Audit Commission, Bribery Commission, Election Commission, and many, many more. And they should have the appropriate authority given by the parliament, which they got from the people. So the first issue, the first issue, for the first issue in Sri Lanka is the weak governance process managed to the constitution. At present, there seems to be a lack of governance or misuse of authority by individuals in all three branches of governance. That's what appears. So such, mis such misuse of authority seems to be the result of insufficient checks and balances in the constitution. By the way, this is the new constitution we inherited in 1978, not the original one we inherited in 1948. In the 1948, there were better checks and balances. So the solution is change the constitution and introduce sufficient checks and balances and strengthen the, strengthen the sovereign authority of the citizens to ensure long-term stability of good governance. The next issue is lack of necessary skills. There is evidence to show that many elected members do not have sufficient skills and experience to fulfill their responsibilities. This is leading to inappropriate use of power vested in them. Now this issue is affecting the performance of ministers as well as MPs and as a result, the performance of, performance of the entire government. That is why we are in this trouble today. Although it's not necessary to all of them to be full experts, each elected member must have sufficient leadership qualities and sufficient intellectual capabilities to communicate with the experts and inspire them to come up with the right solution and implement those solutions in a timely, effective manner. So at the moment, it looks like most elected members do not have those leadership qualities. So the solution is change the constitution to include minimum skills required to be the president, a minister or an MP. These are not purely academic qualifications. They should be demonstrated skills combined with some academic qualifications. So we also at the same time as part of the solution must educate the public about the function of the constitution and the responsibilities of elected members. Fortunately, the younger people at the moment seems to be very well aware of some of these things. And the next issue is the sovereign authority of the citizens is, is not respected. What do I mean by this? In many situations, it has become apparent and very clear that elected members have gone against the wishes of the voters. So the voters initially gave them the power using their sovereign authority and the elected people are not behaving the way they are expected. But at the same time, the voters can't do anything about it because they don't have any tools to do that. So the solution is change the constitution to allow voters to, in the geographical area represented by the offending member to raise a petition and remove the MP if he or she is going against the promises made in the election or against the well-being or wishes of the voters. So how could we do that? The proposal is 
If there are more than 10,000 signatures supporting the petition, the MP must resign and the by-election must be held. Now, this is, by the way, is a practice used in the, in the UK. They used this principle to remove one MP about a year ago. So this is nothing, this is not completely new. This is used in other countries, including UK. So this is a very good tool. And the next issue is necessary skills to be elected to the parliament. The proposal is qualifications required to be mem qualifications, you have to define the qualifications required to be a member of the parliament. The, all the candidates to become MPs must have a minimum of three credit passes. We should not make it too difficult for these people to come to the parliament. So I'm not saying they should have degrees. A level is sufficient, but in addition to that, they must have shown, they must have demonstrated that they have had at least minimum three years of experience in solving problems for the benefit of the society, either in the government or in the private organization. They are responsible for proving that they have that experience. So I'm not saying that we need MPs with degrees because degree alone itself doesn't show anything. There are plenty of people with degrees who hasn't demonstrated the other skills. So it is the responsibility of the candidates if they are standing for the election <laughs> to show that they have the necessary qualifications and experience, both the qualifications and experience, and the election commission is responsible for checking and confirming that the evidence is acceptable. Once elected, I'm proposing that every year MPs must participate in X number of TBD hours of courses. They must be provided by an appropriate educational establishment. The idea is to maintain their knowledge of good governance and relevant legal issues. At the moment, MPs don't seem to have any clue and they have no way to study. They are only focusing on commission. So that needs to be changed. That culture needs to be changed. So the next issue is, again, the necessary skills and qualification to be elected as president or be appointed as a minister. Now, in this case, I'm making slightly different proposal. So the qualification to be a president or the minister, any candidate for presidency, or any MP, to be, any, any MP to be appointed as a minister must have a general degree, minimum second class lower grade in an appropriate subject. So I'm saying MPs can have A-levels, but the ministers or the president must have a, at least a second class lower level degree. In addition, they must demonstrate that they have had at least minimum five years of experience in solving problems for the benefit of the society, either in the government or in a private organization. It is the responsibility of the candidates to provide the evidence, and it's the responsibility of the election commission to check and confirm the evidence is acceptable. Again, whether it's a president or a minister, every year they must go through a certain number of hours of courses to maintain their knowledge of good governance, and also the legal system and their knowledge of their portfolios. So that's the only way they can improve their skills while doing the job. The next issue, how can we persuade MPs to introduce constitution, constitutional changes after the next election? Because most of the existing MPs wouldn't do that. But there are lots of people, lots of younger people who are motivated which I believe they will come into the scene at the next election. So the suggested way forward is this. Request all the candidates to formally declare their commitment to support specific policies proposed by the, or the requested by electorate, electorate. So in their election manifestos, they must show their commitment officially that they are supporting certain policies. They don't have to support every policy. They can select whatever they want and the voters can decide on the basis of those commitments. So there is some sort of legal binding there as well. We, mu we must also educate the voters of the importance of these policies and the governance process. So thank you very much. I try to do it very quickly, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you again.
Thank you. Thank you, Kilfi. Very good. Very summary presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Kirti. Uh, I uh, agree with you 100%. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I will also cover a little bit uh, on this area in my uh, presentation. Uh, the, the, the only problem is the, all these conditions uh, that you mentioned are very good. But how to put them into the uh, new constitution is the problem. Because the new constitution has to be passed by the existing uh, MPs. And, and any, any uh, move to uh, change this, uh, will, uh, you will find resistance at the, at the, the, during the parliament elections in the, in the House of Parliament. So what is your explanation? How to get over this uh, dilemma? You know? <clears throat> right. OK. Let, let me come in and explain how I see it. Lakshman, you are absolutely right. It's not an easy process. The existing MPs will, most of them, not everybody, most of them will resist that. Yes. But at the same time, I'm well aware that there are groups of young people waiting to join the queue of elections at the next, next election. So what we have to ask them, and they, I'm sure they will be prepared to do that, to put in their election manifestos which of these policies they are going to support. So the electorate will have a choice then. They can vote for these people depending on the options they give. And I am fairly confident if we move it in the right direction, if we uh, educate the voters, we are likely to have possibly 50, possibly 100 new MPs in the parliament next time, at least. It could be more. I don't know. Depending, looking at what's happening today, in gold phase, it is very likely they'll have a huge number of new MPs. So if we persuade them to put in the manif election manifestos, exactly what they are going to do, and we need to get the commitment that they are prepared to change the constitution as well. So we have a choice to vote for them. If, if not, if we don't find enough people with the right policies in their manifestos, maybe we think of, we should think about uh, selecting some young people to stand for the election with our support. Yes, now, again, <clears throat> this is okay. Uh, but uh, the whole responsibility lies with the political parties who, who give the list of uh, their nominees for the election. And people don't have a cho choice, uh, I mean, uh, any control over that. It's a political party which determines the list of uh, their nominees. And people have to vote for one of them, few of them. So that's true. That's true again. Yeah. At the moment, that is the situation. But again, that's something we should change in the next new constitution. But at the moment, there are something like, I don't know, 200 registered political parties, huge number. Yes. Only a few are, of course, having a big say. I, so I'm aware of at least one or two smaller parties getting ready for the elections with new policies, with yes. new younger people. So we need to find such a party who are registered, who are willing to stand for our principles. And we need to, so just like the gold phase protests are peacefully getting a lot of support, I believe it is possible to make it happen. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I've got a couple of questions for you, Kirti. I'm just kindergarten in relation to political science. Number one, now, according to your uh, uh, clarification in relation to who should be going into the parliament, having minimal qualification, etc. Yes, that is true. But take, for example, the current system in Sri Lanka, only 10% of the students enter the universities. And maybe... Uh, 10% of that, or even less than that, take a second class lower. So by age 24, you have excluded more than 96% of the population of becoming a minister or a prime minister through the normal system. Then that's one thing. The other thing is, now to look at your own people who passed with you. For example, I look at my own batch who had the same qualification when they got through the university and you expect them to do very well, 
because of the qualification. But 10 years later, you will see in your same batch, there are beggars, there are huge corrupt people, there are thieves, all sorts of people 10 years later within your own batch with the same qualification. So how can you guarantee that in this kind of system? And also, wouldn't it be better to look at the track record of people and see what they have been and how good they have been and so on? Yes, exactly. I think um, track record is the one in addition to the qualifications. So exactly. That's why I said MP should have only A-levels, but they must show at least three years of demonstrated leadership skills yes. making something good. Now, that's where that comes in. Similarly, to become an M uh, minister, they must show at least five years of demonstrated leadership skills doing something good for the society. Now, I can give detailed examples. I'm talking about a lot of experience, not in political areas, but a lot of experience, well, in some ways in political areas as well, because I happen to be, uh, I was elected uh, without going to actually where, to the council, not as a member of the seat, but I was elected to the education committee of the council. So I had the same rights as an elected council member. So I had to go through training. I had to go through the whole process of good governance. And I knew exactly how they made decisions. So, so that is why I keep saying academic qualifications are important to some extent, but they are not the end of, of end all things. Because I know some of the, my colleagues who were at the university many moons ago, who was fighting on the opposite side against me, they have switched sides. And I don't want to give names, but they were, I, I couldn't believe certain cases when I, when I saw them, what they are doing today. They are supporting corruption. They are supp supporting, they are, they are benefiting from corruption. But when they were at the university, they were the extreme socialists trying to do good for the society. So academic qualifications and university of education on its own is nothing, not, not, not sufficient. So we must change the education system as well. In fact, I am, without going a lot of details, I am taking part in various courses for school students and university students in Sri Lanka, talking to them about leadership and uh, good personal qualities, not science, well, science and technology as well, but I talk a lot about leadership. So we must change the education system so that we do not teach people to solve theoretical problems on paper, but they must change them, train them to use scientific and technical information to solve real problems using people as human beings. I don't know if, if that is a good enough answer. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's good I, in a way, but I my question is, now you got good suggestions. How, how are we going to get there? How are we going to get there? We know the final outcome we want, but we need to get there. How do we do that? Right. The, to get there, the only way is to educate the masses. From a school age, university age, it's, it's a very slow process. It's, it's not something going, which is going to produce results in a year or two. It might take 10 years, but we can get there. Because um, I know of other movements, not to change the politics, but in other movements, people have done extremely successfully. But if I take the political take, uh, example, I will take the example of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Mahatma Gandhi changed the entire Indian society without raising a single weapon. He managed to get rid of British rule. Now, that was not quick. That took a lot of time. So similarly, yes, we must, we can get there very slowly by educating people. But I think at the present time, because of the modern tools and because of the younger generation have access to modern tools, younger people are more open for suggestions and education. And that is why they are standing up today. So, but nevertheless, it is, it's, it's, get, it's going to take a sev several years. No, it's not a one or two years quick solution. 
Yeah, education is the key. I agree with that. But Mahatma Gandhi did it with role modeling, not just talking. So, so you need to combine role modeling with what you're talking, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think that's the other point. For anybody, not for the leaders only, for anybody in the society, we must highlight the fact that the words we talk must reflect what we think. And what we do must reflect what we talk. So at the moment in the political arena, people think one thing, say something else, and do something else. So until we get people to think, talk, and do exactly what they think is right, situation wouldn't change. But because people are saying things against their thoughts and doing things against their words, people are very ill. They are not healthy as well. So the health and economy and everything will improve gradually when people, especially younger people, begin to realize that they must think and say things according to what they think and do things according to what they say. That's the universal human principle. So um, I'm, I'm uh, agreeing with you, but um, it, it, is, it is a slow that's process. That's okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kirti. So we, we'll continue because Professor Lakshman also wants to talk five minutes. So I think there are no other raised hands. So let's go to Professor Lakshman Sanagi. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Chula. <clears throat> Uh, I will just uh, take five minutes or maybe a little longer. Uh, confined to the today's uh, subject, that is uh, the, the, the immediate problem that the country is facing today. <clears throat> so our team, the four member team has gone to the IMF and tomorrow they are going to have discussions on uh, how to uh, <clears throat> rescue the country from this uh, severe crisis first in our history. Uh, <clears throat> so IMF has uh, three kind of uh, schemes to rescue uh, developing countries facing this kind of uh, economic uh, challenges. So the last one is uh, rapid credit facility. It's, uh, I, Sri Lanka is ideally uh, qualified to, to get support under that uh, IMF uh, criterion. I hope something will uh, <clears throat> happen in the next few days. But there is one little issue here. Mm, the, uh, one of the preconditions of the IMF is, is there has to be political stability and social stability. Uh, now in Pakistan case recently, mm, there was a kind of a similar situation, economic crisis. So there's a uh, uh, first, uh, you show us your political stability. Uh, so they had the election and they elected a new prime minister. And now IMF is ready to talk with them. In our case, the scenario is uh, quite uh, worse with regard to these preconditions. That is one point. Mm. <clears throat> so as you all know, uh, our Sri Lanka's uh, credit rating has been uh, put down from double C to single C. So we are, we are just just about the complete bankruptcy situation. <clears throat> so getting some help from the IMF is again, will depend on, uh, because we are not politically stable, we are not socially stable at this critical moment. Uh, <clears throat> we have foreign reserves, 1.9 billion US dollars, uh, just enough to supply uh, food and other essential things for one month only. Again, there are other lim lim limitations uh, how to use this. It's mainly a Chinese uh, connection. So you may have to buy things from China. Uh, <clears throat> and another uh, pending uh, risky situation is the banking system in Sri Lanka is nearly uh, in an unstable situation. So the next step, uh, when the country goes bankrupt, the banks will start uh, restricting their uh, withdrawals and things like that. I hope Sri Lanka will not come to that phase uh, in the next couple of months. And if you go through the literature, Greece is one of the countries which has gone through this kind of uh, situation several times and rescued with IMF help again. Uh, those two preconditions, three 
three preconditions that I mentioned. Two is a social stability and political stability and the economic thing. And we are versed in all these three. So I don't think Greece uh, case uh, may be different. So I, I, I don't know the details. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the next option left for us is to go for very high interest commercial loans. Uh, again, with this uh, uh, credit rating, that is going to be a difficult task. Uh, <clears throat> so suppose we get over this uh, difficult moment through IMF support, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> what are the immediate income generators to, to uh, our country in the uh, next six months or so? Uh, <clears throat> one thing is the tourism, because we are heading for the December tourist season. So tourism will, can bring us quick foreign exchange, very quick. That is a, probably the fastest. Then the foreign uh, exchange remittances from our workforce, uh, mainly in the Middle East, it's going through the wrong route now, the black market route, uh, because we have lost as a result of wrong decisions. We have lost this uh, group. Uh, so there should be a way to attract them back to our uh, state system, state banking system, to attract their remittances by giving them uh, various privileges, maybe duty free purchases or um, something which uh, will convince them, uh, okay. Uh, there's a time to uh, remit officially through our state banking system. Maybe uh, low interest housing loans or due to free purchases, etc. So that is another quick uh, foreign exchange earner, the expatriate remittances. And then the exports, garments, and as uh, Tula mentioned, uh, grow exports, value added uh, things. So these are the uh, uh, few uh, ways we can develop our foreign exchange reserves in the next six months or so. So it is expected that the next two months is going to be very, very uh, serious for Sri Lanka economically uh, with or without IMF conditions. Mm, either way, uh, next two months is going to be very, very serious. Now, let me spend a couple of more minutes, mm, again, uh, connected with uh, Kirti's presentation. I am still not convinced what these protesters are heading for now. Okay, they say go to go home. That symbolizes many things. They don't need the present uh, system of uh, ministers and MPs and cabinets and all this. Probably they don't also want uh, uh, the present uh, constitution. So how to get over this is a problem. To change the constitution, you need the support of existing MPs. Uh, and the, the general idea is most of them uh, will not be acceptable to the general public, not only to the protesters. So, but they are, but uh, they are supposed to change the constitution, which will be done in their favor, not in our favor. So, these are the points to be <laughs> think uh, and pass on uh, to our colleagues and eventually to the decision makers. So, thank you for your attention. Um, I think Kirthi, I'm going to just make some comments before you uh, talk, Kirthi. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lakshman, for bringing the focus into the, the today's discussion. And um, I agree that we have a major issue with the IMF uh, trying to get something. But I think if IMF agrees, it's in a way you get some kind of an external audit into what we are doing into to my, our money. So your corruption will reduce to some extent as a result of it. So that's another positive aspect. Even if it will be difficult for the population, it will be a recovery tool in a way. Uh, and also, I mean, we can do little things, um, major things as well, slowly and slowly, but these are important. And, and tourism, you said, is something that can uh, bring in um, things. Some but there are the, the Problem with tourism is that it depends on how it get advertised in the other countries, for example. At the moment, the government advice is not to go in the UK, for example. So to change that, you need safety, stability, ability to move around. Even the Sri Lankans are resisting to go back to Sri Lanka now, uh, even for a holiday because of various other difficulties. 
So, so that's another thing that we need to improve in relation to safety and traveling and, and the availability of foods and everything else. I believe because of the um, import restrictions, the hotels do not have even the foods that the visitors want to have, for example. So, so these are not quite attractive situations at the moment, but that is something one can um, talk and also try to educate people. So this way, people recognize the issues you have and also um, supporting the expats. I mean, we have not really supported the expat in a way for even the COVID pandemic. Remember the troubles our people had abroad. They were in corners here and there. We did not transport them back home when all the other countries did, supported their own citizens to come back home. But our people stopped them from coming home. So, and then there was this, uh, you know, restrictions in hotels and everything else. So the expats already have a really negative experience in relation to what can happen. And the black market is another one that is instituted by the government itself, where you get 200 rupees when you can get 300 rupees outside for a dollar. So obviously people have started using other methods, which means that actually prompted a black market both ways for corruption as well. So, and cryptocurrency is another major thing that has come through and that is also installing corruption all around. So that's kind of hidden corruption. Nobody knows exactly what's going this way or that way. So, so these are issues in the long term that one has to address. But I think the main thing now we have is to recovery. So I think it's better that we somehow get to some kind of stability using the recovery suggestions that's coming from people. I mean, in the long term, changing constitution, as you say, is a major issue, but can be done, provided the whole population is educated in relation to the most important changes we need to do. So, so these are the kind of things that I have. And I allow uh, Kirsi, you can talk now, yeah. Thank you. Right, I think, I mean, Lakshman, you covered many, many different subjects in those few minutes. So the answer is not going to be easy. There are a lot of different answers, but I'm going to take a hypothetical case first. Now, a few weeks ago, Chula, you used a bucket with a lot of holes. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of holes. Yeah. So we are trying to patch a few holes at the moment. Very good. That's not going to work. You have to change the bloody bucket. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. So that's what the that's what the protesters are asking for. So what they are trying to do is to show that look, look how great we are. We are going to patch up this hole, that hole, this hole. We'll do the yes. That's not going to work. Exactly. That is my honest opinion. <clears throat> now, of course, having said that, we have a crisis. We have to find a way to buy food. We have to find a way to feed people. So the only way is to go to IMF and submit to them and get some money. And eventually that will happen. Now that is not the long-term solution, but as long as the bucket is full of holes, it's still there, in the long term, it's not going to work. Mm. I think, I hope my answer is fairly accurate in describing the situation. Now, another thing is, I saw this email a few days ago Somebody was comparing the protests in Sri Lanka to Armenia. Because in 2008, in Armenia, there were a lot of protests. Mm. And after about 12 days, the protesters disappeared. Now, somebody selected that example very cleverly to discourage the protesters. But they forgot about UK, uh, France, Egypt, Indonesia. So I circulated that email. In fact, UK is the first place there was a mass protest 400 years ago, 1688. They got rid of the king without a single bloodshed by protesting 400 years ago, right? But of course, in France, there was a lot of bloodshed, but nevertheless, they took 10 years, but they changed the government and the entire system. So the French system, which is running now, based on the physical unrest in the country. Then in Egypt, um, in 2011, I think, uh, 
not Mubarak. Yes, uh, I think it was Mubarak. He was in power for 40 years, first as the prime minister, then as the president. And the, when the unrest started, he resisted, he used all kinds of things. But after a year, after, after 12 days, he had to resign. And then he had to spend in prison about six years. He was eventually released in 2017, but he died because he was 91 years old in 2020, two years ago. So there was unrest. They didn't, you know, in those countries. Then in, in Indonesia, again, Suharto was in power for over something like 30 years. That unrest lasted one year. Eventually, they got rid of him. So, of course, our, our media machine and the government, they are doing their very best to discourage and do some things. Of course, they attempted it several times in the last few days, but every time, because there are a lot of young lawyers, not young only, there are some 600 lawyers fighting for these people. They managed to legally stop a lot of actions. So I think whatever happens, we are going to get some good results out of this. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but what we can do is to think of a long-term plan. We cannot expect miracles in the short term. So that, I'm sorry, you know, I hope I, I answered two questions. <laughs> yeah, Kirti, uh, just one minute. Uh, <clears throat> most of the examples that you mentioned, I don't know about the, the, the very old UK uh, change, but um, other recent examples are the Philippines and Iran. Uh, mass uh, protests led to new leadership. Uh, but in all these cases, or at least most of these cases, there was a shadow leadership to start with, which we don't have. You, you are right, these protests started without any real leadership. But in any situation, what happens is leadership evolves gradually Imagine. in any situation. So, um, and also, I mean, for example, like me, I'm, I'm from a distance, I'm trying to give whatever the support they need from a distance. I also know a lot of other groups doing the same thing. So. I think the leadership will evolve. There are already few leaders. I don't want to name them, mention name, name names, but there are few young leaders. They are not established political leaders, but they are established leaders doing things. For example, there's one group, they have been educating 100 young people to become politicians in the next election. Because they started by selecting young people, they were educating them in political science and management. And they are hoping to put 100 candidates into the new election. <coughs> and they have a political party as well. Of course, 100 <coughs> with 100 candidates, they are, not, they are not going to make a government. Very unlikely, not next election. Maybe the election after, in eight years. But they are going in the right direction. So similarly, there are other groups so I think we need to keep an eye open for such people and give a bit of our experience and wisdom to them. In fact, with one group, I had some discussions. I, in fact, challenged one of their assumptions and they didn't particularly like it, but at least they had to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, think, I think it will be good for us to focus on more facts and evidence and show people the facts and evidence so that people will learn if you do that. So if you just talk about something in the hiding or whatever we want to achieve, we're not going to have much support. So our focus was mainly trying to educate people as much as possible. And I think it will eventually lead to something good. So let the people decide what they want to do. What we can do is just educate them. That's all mm. we can do at the moment. And also in a small scale, we may be able to promote various activities as well. So let's see what we can do. I mean, I'm not talking about, because in Sri Lanka, people think even the opposition thinks they can't do anything without power. That's the concept they have. Even the younger one think they can't do anything without power. But I've been in Sri Lanka, I've done major things without power. So you can do it. So, so you need to be able to propose and educate people as to why we should be doing this. That's my kind of 
agreement that I have with all the comments that come through. So please, if there's anybody else to talk about, we can do may that. I, may I take one minute to say something? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Just to compliment what you said. Now, I have not been in politics, but I have been working for a very large organization. I was not the, at the top of the ladder, but I was in a fairly responsible position. But in my responsible positions, I had only about three or four people working directly for me, but I had to control the output of, output of over several hundred people, engineers, scientists, very educated people. I had to, I had to manage their output. So without any authoritative power of these people, I had to motivate them to get the results. So I know because of that, it is possible to influence others without having the authority. So that's why I'm talking about leadership. Now, the changing, what you say in other words is changing the mindset. Changing yes. the mindset we all discussed and you told as well, it's education. So education yes. is changing the mindset, but we have to change education in a way so that people believe because we present facts and evidence. Yes, that's absolutely, I agree. It. So that's no, no, no. the way we I should. I fully agree. Now, the, the, we had to present facts and evidence now, sometimes what happens is, again, if I may go in that direction, when there are lots of facts, what people do is, for their, with their political motivations, they select some of the true facts and change the complete picture without taking all the facts. So we have to be conscious of that, that possibility and educate people to select the facts, whatever the facts available, but try to identify the full picture sometimes it's missing information okay let, let's see whether there's any other people in the audience who want to talk please because there are some others who may want to talk is there anybody there who wants to talk please there, there is a hand up somebody yeah um uh, my name is uh, kirti vijay kula ratna i have a question for uh, professor dharmadasa yeah professor dharmadasa is still on the audience i think yeah he's there okay. yeah Hold on one second. Let me see whether I can get my. Uh, sorry, I cannot get my video, but uh, I try to put my question. Uh, Professor Dharmadasa, are you there? Yeah, he's yes, there. I'm, he's there. Here. I'm listening. Oh, okay. Actually, uh, my question is uh, about that uh, solar village uh, that uh, you mentioned. Uh, I just want to know average in Sri Lankan house how much uh, kilowatt. Like, I, if I understand correctly, like. Uh, Five kilowatts, and uh, and then the cost of uh, you know implementing the solar power. I want to divide this question into two. Sorry, uh, I cannot hear you. Because uh, solar village is a completely a it's a it's a social development program. Uh, what if I if I take one solar village not here. What we have done is we have installed six kilowatt solar roof, connected that to the national grid through net plus scheme. It gives them about 12,000 rupees per month. So that mm -hmm. is the income. So if you want to develop any society, the first thing is you have to create a wealth creation system. So what we do is, we create a village development committee and that committee without corruption, we ask them to have 50-50 uh, men and women uh, and manage those funds to develop the community. So it is not for uh, one home or two home, it is for the whole village. So the oh, I see. It, it is a community program. Uh, when oh, it comes to a when it comes to a solar roof, say five kilowatt or a six kilowatt solar roof, uh, you can you can install a solar roof on your home. There are three systems now in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, net metering, net accounting, and net plus. I think at this stage, the problem is. <laughs> Grid is, grid is switched off. So yeah. that is the problem. So even if you uh, produce solar energy, 
you are in the dark in the night because uh, uh, net metering and uh, net accounting, you connect the system to the national grid. You use some energy <laughs> when you want. I think net, net metering is the best because at least you have the opportunity to use your energy within the home before you export. So uh, yeah, it brings a lot of problems uh, these days. So please don't take this as a solar village is a community development program. Uh, solar roof is a, uh, one home, one solar roof. If we have 1 million roofs, like in uh, Germany, just 1 million 5 kilowatt solar roof will produce during the daytime 5 gigawatts. That is more than our power generation, 4 gigawatts. <clears throat> yeah, Lachman, okay. Lakshman, you yeah. have any comments to make? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dharmi. <clears throat> now, uh, about... I, 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 I have another question, actually. I didn't finish my question. Uh, this is for Professor right. Dharmdasa. Sorry okay. to interrupt you. Uh, this uh, actually uh, the, the, another question I have is: uh, Is these houses in Sri Lanka are they getting a, a battery? You know, the battery with the solar panel. Because if you don't have battery, you cannot uh, use the uh, you know energy at night. Uh, something like that. I'm I'm kind of wondering that uh, it's it's 24 hours uh, that the energy is there, you know. Yeah, let, let me answer that first. Uh, you know, uh, some years ago, uh, Surya Balasangrame came with those three things, uh, how, to, how to connect to the national grid. When you connect to the national grid, you don't need a battery system because what you do is uh, during the daytime, you feed the grid, during the nighttime, you use the energy from the grid. national grid. So you don't oh, need the battery system. But unfortunately uh -huh. now, when they cut off uh, electricity, even if you have a solar roof, you are in the dark. So that is why I suggested to go back. In fact, we are going back to about 30, uh, three decades back, solar home mm -hmm. systems. Solar home system is the simplest one even for a smallest, uh, poorest family, one solar panel on the roof, charge a car battery during the daytime, during the nighttime, have <coughs> four or five LEDs mm. and charge your mobile phones and also mm -hmm. power for the uh, television or the radio. So you can increase that power by adding solar Panel. So that is called the solar home system. I think I if we have if we have power cuts in the future, it is <clears> better <throat> to go for solar home systems. The smallest one will cost about twenty five thousand rupees, and as you increase it, it will go up to a solar roof size, five kilowatt size. So any size you can have in between. But uh, during the power cuts. It is better to have a battery. At least you are not in the dark. Right, right. I understand that uh, if I understand correctly, that uh, my going back to my first question, for in order to get uh, for individual houses, you know, individual house. So, so you said that you had to have that the whole village that uh, have that uh, solar panel system in order to, you know, as a project like, right? So that you cannot apply or you cannot request uh, to get uh, this solar panel for individual house without having the whole village? No, no, that, that will cost a lot of money. And uh, obviously to, to install one uh, uh, solar roof, it costs about 1 million rupees. We do it uh, with donations and charities. Uh, this is just to develop that whole society not just individual houses. What we do is we, we get an income through that solar roof, uh, ask the VDC to develop the school, develop the, uh, their library, develop their school, that kind of things. So it uh -huh. is a social development program. In fact, I gave the YouTube uh, at the end of my presentation. If you can uh -huh. watch it, uh, that okay. will give you 
uh, full details. Oh, okay. Okay, I understand. So the last question that I have is, uh, who, who made these uh, solar panels? All these solar panels are imported to the country. Unfortunately, uh, we can't manufacture them at the uh, moment. Uh, so from Australia, from India, from Germany, uh, people uh, import solar panels. And there are about 60 active solar uh, companies in the country. They are installing oh, them. You can talk to them and uh, uh, get your, just say what you want and they will uh -huh. come and fix it. It takes only one or two days. It doesn't take long days at all. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dharma. That's uh, actually, I'm one of your uh, brother's batchmate, Kirti Vijayakuratna. My All name. right. Thank you. Thank you for joining Thank us, Kirti. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Yeah. Lakshman had some uh, comments, Lakshman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> These related to the questions that uh, Mr. Vijayakuratna asked. Now, recently, uh, my next door, that's my daughter's house, we installed a solar roof. Uh, these called uh, grid connected solar roof, as uh, Dharma mentioned. Mm, it's a uh, six kilowatt system, uh, but the family needs only maximum three kilowatts. Uh, but we went for a six kilowatt system and it costed us nearly nine lakhs, including solar panels, inverters, and everything. So these connected to the grid. Uh, and uh, my, this is my daughter's house. Uh, they used to pay about seven, eight thousand rupees a month you know, before putting the system in uh, to the CEB. And now uh, they are getting uh, money, six, seven, uh, sorry, uh, seven, 8,000 rupees a month uh, into their account by the CEB. So the net result is, is a profit of 15,000 a month. That means the, the, the total cost will be covered in four years time. So it's a very uh, profitable system and clean energy system. Only thing is, that, as Dharmi mentioned, when there is a power cut, uh, they are also in the dark. <laughs> so because there is no battery, we are directly feeding into the uh, grid, national grid. If you want to add a battery, uh, you have to add for a good battery at least another three, four lakhs. Then you can have uh, that. Thank you. System Thank you, Lakshman. These are real data from, from a system. Yes. I yes. think perhaps for this uh, um, situation, in this situation, Lakshman, even a car battery, if you can have a, a charging system and a, a few uh, LED lights connected to the battery, I think you can be uh, uh, you can uh, remove that problem uh, during these power cuts. Yeah. So what Dharma says is an off-grid system, uh, not connected to the grid. Is it uh, correct, Dharma? Uh, yes, but uh, I am wondering. Your system is already connected to the grid. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, but uh, if you can somehow yeah. uh, connect, a, I mean, a small car battery or low battery, uh, the lorry battery, yeah, uh, in the house, yeah. uh, charge it during the daytime. It will charge anyway. Yeah. And then uh, and then with the battery from the battery, you can have four or five lights as you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, LEDs. Yeah. Yes, so like a backup. that way, that like way you can uh, you can be in the light yeah. during power cuts. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that can be done. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very good. I think it was a very practical discussion. At the end of the day, that's fantastic because people understand the issues and how to sort it out. And you can see, uh, Dharmadas are now how simple you need to be. We are like in the kindergarten. You have to teach us <laughs> how to. <laughs> how to get these things sorted out. Any other questions from the audience? I think people have, some of them have left already. It's taken a long time. So can I close now uh, for the today and then we'll meet up again next week. I think- we'll Chula, have... Chula, excuse me. Now next yeah. week, the topic will be the same, no? Economic I crisis. Think, I think we will probably have to talk yeah. about that because yeah. not going yeah. into long details about how to do, you know, yeah. constitution change. What we really need is how to resolve the current situation. I know that people need to do IMF and various things, yeah. but we'll have more data as we go along. So it's good to mm. discuss as well. Mm. So I hope people will be able to have continued with this consultation rather than a presentation. So- no, immediate, I, immediate crisis, right? 
immediate crisis. I think it's more important to talk yes. about the immediate crisis. Yeah, yeah, right. Because yeah. the first thing is we don't want to let it be hijacked. The second thing yeah. is yeah. we don't want violence. Yeah. So yes. So two important things. So so let's see whether we can get there. And if you all can present a little bit about verbally or whatever is fine, just yeah. to focus on how to how to come out of this immediate danger. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all Thank you. Thank you, uh, for participation. I'll send you the link later on once we've got it converted. Yeah. Our yeah. talks today. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much. Yeah. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.